Good morning, Hill City family. We are so excited you joined us. If this is your first time with us, we pray that you leave this moment encouraged and that you can tap into the community right here via a Zoom discussion group following this message. We do church anywhere on these weeks where people are meeting all over the city in homes, at restaurants and parks and right online so that we can dive deeper into this word and truly become disciples by applying what we learn to our life today. Let's hop in and pray. Father, we pray that right now you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see and hearts to receive what you have for us. We pray that every seed you plant today takes deep and eternal rooting, that we may see fruit come from our lives all the days of our lives. Jesus, let us walk away today knowing just how good you are. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Today, I have the wonderful privilege of really starting our series on too good to not believe. It's a collection of talks that we are going to discuss the attributes of the good God we serve. And so today I get to kick us off with the attribute of a God who forgives. I mean, isn't that the first way we get introduced to God? He is a God who forgives us of all of our sins, who washes us and makes us clean and holy, that we might wear Christ's righteousness and be presented as a son, just like Jesus, as a daughter, because of his sacrifice and of his gift of forgiveness. As we unpack this word briefly in our time today, I want to start us in this journey in Acts 9. If you've walked with the Lord for any period of time, it is one of the common stories we learn of, of the disciples, and that is on the road to Damascus with Saul. This is the conversion moment of Saul to Paul. And so here in 9, starting in the first verse, it says, Then Paul, still breathing, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? As the scriptures go on, and today we're going to actually take the time within our church anywhere groups, the, the scripture goes on and essentially he declares, Jesus, I will do what it is that you ask of me. But I want to highlight three facets of this journey with Saul that we can see the full measure of what forgiveness looks like in God and so what it should look like in us. In 9.1, it says that Paul, Saul, before he's become Paul, Saul was still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. Did you know that when Saul is on his road to Damascus. He's not going because he's starting to feel kind of shameful and bad for killing believers of the way of Jesus, those who are following him. No, no, he's going with the full intent of, of finding those who are of the way and persecuting them, perhaps killing them as he had done thousands of times prior. Here he is in this moment, a murderer, declaring threats against the almighty God. And God stops him in his tracks and speaks to him. The first place I want you to know is, did you know that God speaks to those who are not yet following him? Do you know that the one that you have a hard time with, who you're like, they don't know God, and, 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 and they, maybe perhaps you've gotten haughty and angry with, that God speaks even to them. 
It's easy within the confines of our Christian circles to begin to get this mindset that Holy Spirit can't deal with or talk to someone who doesn't walk intimately with him. But that's far from the truth. He is the one who draws all men and none can come lest they be drawn by his spirit. And so here is a loving and a holy God who is so gracious and so good that he says to Saul, you're killing my people. And I want you to stop that saw. I want you to know who I am and I want you to serve me and follow me. In one single moment of Saul's life, the holy and perfect God says, I've already forgiven you, Saul. Do you know who I am? Will you do what I've asked you? And Saul responds and says, yes, you know, basically I have no choice here because I know and I've been face to face with who you are. I'm overwhelmed by who the reality of the love and and the goodness that you are. I will serve you, Lord. In this moment, we see a holy, forgiving, love-centered God. You know, we have a hard time when someone cuts us off in traffic. We get real angry and think, well, that guy pulls into my parking space. I'm going to have a word with him. You know, we, we get real haughty over a moment that didn't even change our life, but it rubbed our nerve. That quite honestly, if that rub is there, it's already been exposed and it's something in you that needs to be taken back to the Father. But in those moments... We find forgiveness hard to access, but yet this radical love of Jesus, as this man is breathing murderous threats to the people who follow Jesus, he says, Saul, I love you. I forgive you for everything you've done. Will you come and walk with me? This forgiveness put such a demand on Saul's heart and on his mind and on his emotions and on his will that he responds and says, I will follow you wherever you lead, Lord. This is the type of forgiveness as believers we are called to function in continually and always. Scripture says seven times 70. And it's not just reserved for our brother who is in Christ, who has done us wrong, or who hasn't showed up and supported us as we think they should. Come on. We're talking about a holy God who is speaking to a man who has murdered and killed his people. This is the love and the forgiveness that chased Saul down. So then where is it to be found in us? We must recognize our holy God forgives. So we in turn, as replicators, as re-presenters of Christ, we must be those who walk continually in forgiveness. You cut me off, I'm real angry, but God bless them, Lord, I forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Here's Saul in this story, and I want you as a group to continue to read the rest of this chapter. But it goes on, and Saul goes blind for three days. His blindness really is what paved way for him to have eyes for the first time to truly see God in the full measure of who he is. May we as believers be blinded that we may fully see Jesus. As he is blind in this moment, he's led into Jerusalem. And, 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 and this man, he, he's, he's called to go to, he's go to Damascus. He's called to go and see this man and basically God gives him a dream and says, he's going to come and he's going to pray for you. But what I love about God's forgiveness and this radical story that I feel so beautifully orchestrates how forgiveness is to work. A holy and pure God forgives a sin-filled man, a murderous man, who then goes and sees a disciple who's serving Jesus. And now this disciple, what is being asked of this disciple, Ananias? Is Ananias, Paul, God says to Ananias, listen, there's a man that's going to come to you, Saul. You might be familiar with him. Yeah, that guy who murdered uh, Stephen that you were present for and you saw and you knew. Yeah, that guy, you're going to go because he's blind. Okay, And you're going to pray for him to receive his sight. And Ananias has this banter and he's like, like, Saul, 
like, like for real though, because if I go to him and, and, and I'm, I'm interjecting my own thoughts of what he must have been thinking, because he gives a little bit of his dialogue, but not the full measure. And I think if I were Ananias, I would say something along the lines of, God, have you lost your mind? I mean, do you realize when I go to this man, he's seeking, he's coming to Damascus, that he might bring us before Jerusalem, that he might persecute or kill us. Like, like, God, this man, and you struck him blind? Thank you, Jesus, that you struck him blind. He's finally getting some of what he deserves. Now, God, maybe you're asking me to do something of what he's already done to us. I can do that uh, eye for an eye thing right now. I, is that what you're asking of me? And God says, no, Ananias, Saul is going to come. You are going to pray for him. His eyesight is going to be restored, and then I'm going to use him mightily among you and the believers to build this kingdom. I mean, here's Ananias, has to be thinking, <laughs> okay, uh, God, I, I'm not quite sure why you're not giving him what I feel like he should get. But okay, I'm gonna pray for him and he's gonna receive his sight. I think that's good enough. But no, 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 i have now, if I'm Ananias, I now have to reconcile this fact that this murderous man who literally killed those who Ananias would have been in community with, he killed, was a murderer, those people that he loved. And now Ananias is being asked of the Lord. Not only do you forgive him, Ananias, not really a choice. Remember, we gave up the right to self and choice when we accepted Jesus. Ananias, no, no, it's not your right or your choice to forgive. You forgive him now, just as I've forgiven him. And in that full measure of forgiveness, love will so fill you and my spirit so fill you that he will receive his sight. You will restore this man back to his original version, but better. And then... You must cheer and encourage your brother on, spur him forward as I place him in authority and positions and places above even you in this journey. We get upset when we get passed by for a promotion at work by someone who's been there, maybe not quite as long, but close. God in one moment is taking a murderer and placing him as one of the greatest among the disciples, as one who will declare his good news to the world. And Ananias must forgive. What happens next, Ananias takes him after he prays, he receives his sight and he baptizes Saul. This third place and, and, and almost symbol and beauty of forgiveness falls in baptism. And the reason I love the way this story comes together is because I feel in this moment, if I am Ananias once again, if I am him and I now have a murderer, I've had to forgive him. I've had to walk through that in my heart and in my mind. And I'm probably going to have to continue to walk in forgiveness. Every time I walk past Stephen's family and see them, I have to think I forgive him. I forgive him, Lord, right? Pastor Ben preached a beautiful message a year, a year or two ago. And he said, forgiveness is a process of continually forgiving. And I thought that was so beautifully put. That's where Ananias must reside is continually forgive him. And now he gets the opportunity to baptize him. Remind you, let me remind you, Ananias is not one of the apostles. Ananias is not a pastor. He's not a teacher. He's not a... Ananias is just like you and I. He's a believer. And now he gets the beautiful opportunity to baptize Paul in water. 
This baptism is significant for both Ananias and Saul. Why? Because Saul in this moment is declaring, Father, I've said yes to you. I know fully who you are, Jesus. I will no longer be of the old. Let this mark me forever. Let this be a public declaration that the old thing has passed away. And behold, I am a new person baptized in you, Holy Spirit, known by you, Father. Let this water wash away my past even as you have separated me from it as far as the east is from the west and simultaneously Ananias as he's dunking him under the water I imagine he too goes through some sort of his own baptism again a baptism that renews and changes his mind a figurative baptism with Holy Spirit that says I have burned up every part of you that thinks you get a say in this thing. I have caused you to die with Christ that he may truly live through you. These moments of Saul journeying to Damascus, meeting Ananias and being baptized are so beautifully illustrative of what our life with Jesus has looked like and should be looking like. I implore you in your church anywhere group to take the time to read Acts the ninth chapter and look at all the things that happen even afterwards and it's beautiful. I want us to forever as believers be challenged to die more that truly Christ may live more through us. If you have not had an opportunity to be baptized yet, we have that coming up, up on the hill next week, and you can do that online. It's not the place where you receive forgiveness. No, no. You receive forgiveness the moment you gave your life to Jesus. But it is a public declaration where you say, just like Saul, my murderous ways, Father, you've forgiven. And now I publicly declare they're washed away, and I will walk in the newness of life even as Christ has clothed me with his righteousness. Let's pray. Father, as they gather together in homes, online, in restaurants, and parks, God, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would light their hearts on fire, that they would burn anew with a love, a passion for forgiveness, and for understanding of how much you have already forgiven them. Do what only you can do, Holy Spirit, and transform us from glory to glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.